45. Shouldn't be very difficult to find if you go to just about the center of the Bible. You'll probably find the book of Isaiah. And in chapter 45 of Isaiah, and I'm going to read one verse to begin. I'm speaking to you this morning on the God who hides. Isaiah 45, verse 15. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Now, the background to this statement and to the chapter is what we call the exile. Uh, it's a period in the history of Old Testament Israel, which was, except for the Exodus, is the most eventful, important um, act of God's intervention in the whole Old Testament. Well, I guess you could say creation, but but the exile has about a third of all the Old Testament either written about it, during it, or after it, interpreting it. The people of Israel had turned to idols, and God had given them over as a chastisement to Babylon's armies under Nebuchadnezzar. After centuries of worshiping these gods of the pagans and child sacrifice and demon worship, it, it was the Old Testament talks about it, it was awful. Finally, God brought the Babylonians in they besieged the city, captured Jerusalem, and deported hundreds of thousands to Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. Baghdad is about 50 miles from, from uh, Old Testament Babylon. All the Jews were marched, both old and young, 700 miles to the river Kibar, or the, uh, uh, also Euphrates. You might remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den. He was put there by Nebuchadnezzar. That's in Babylon. The three Hebrew children in the fire. The three Hebrew children, that was, they were put in the fire by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. And Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, he's the guy who partied all night. And a hand wrote on the wall in front of everybody, your kingdom has been weighed and you are lacking and so we're removing it from you. And Daniel had to come in and interpret it for him. Well, indeed it was. That night, a man named Cyrus the Persian. Persia is modern-day Iran. They came in and captured, while half the population was drunk, they captured this, this huge city of Babylon, and uh, he had a partner, Cyrus had a partner named Darius. And together, the Medes and Persians captured. It was a big event, happened around 525 years before Jesus was born. Now, look at Isaiah 44, verse 28. Speaking of Cyrus, God says, He is my shepherd. He will fulfill all my purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, She will be built and the temple, your foundation, will be laid. Chapter 45 of Isaiah, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to His anointed. And the, the Hebrew word there is uh, Meshua or Messiah. 
He's like a Messiah, a deliverer, an anointed one. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, and I will subdue, subdue nations before him. Here's the thing about this reference to Cyrus. If you look up in any commentary, you can even Google it. When was Isaiah the prophet written? Everyone says, I agree, 700, around 700 years before Christ. But historically, we know Cyrus did not even exist till around 550 years before Christ. So in other words, you have 700 years when Isaiah was written, predicting by name a man, Cyrus, who wouldn't be alive for another 150 years. Now you talk about the accuracy of Scripture. It leaves your mouth dropped open. It'd be like in 1850, somebody predicted that a man named George Bush would become president and that he would conquer Iraq. How, how does, what book in the world equals the Bible in that kind of precision? So, to top it off, Cyrus wasn't even a believer. He was an idolater, a pagan. Look at verse uh, 4, Isaiah 45, verse 4. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen people, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. He wanted to name him specifically 150 years ahead of time because he wanted his people to know that God's in charge, God knows exactly what's going on, and they can have peace, even in exile. Listen, it helps to know that God knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what you're suffering. The children of Israel were in great grief. To them, they had no future, no hope, no faith, no joy. Psalm 137 was written by someone in the exile. The exile happened around 600 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar took them, captured them, took them to Babylon. They were there for 70 years. While they were there, Psalm 137 says, verse 1, By the waters of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps, our lyres, stringed instruments on the willow trees. Our captors required of us songs. Our tormentors required mirth. They wanted us to be happy. Hey, sing us one of those songs that David wrote. But they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we worship under these circumstances. Amen? Can you worship in the situation and under the circumstances in which you find yourself in exile? How can I pray? How can I recover? How can I ever be happy again? This passage, this chapter, is given to people in exile who feel the condemnation of their own judgment. God has intervened. God has brought this upon me. I have no song. It's not in me to worship. By the way, if you want to know how to use the Old Testament, Romans 15 and 4, 
Paul tells us how. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through the encouragement of Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, we might have hope. The Old Testament is to bring us to the place of hope. So Isaiah, I'll summarize it by saying Isaiah gives the exiles. Remember, this is 150 years before it happened. He, it was there waiting on them. When they went into exile, they already had the prophet Isaiah. So they, whatever situation you're in, God knew ahead of time what it was going to be like, and he prepared some promises for you in that exile, in that circumstance. There's some promises in this book for whatever you're in, because God saw to it before you ever got into that, that your needs would be met, and there were promises to be believed, and there were joys that you could receive. So Isaiah gives them this advice to those in exile. First, he tells them they need to stop complaining and see God. Look at verse 9 and 10. He says, Woe to him who strives or struggles with him who formed him a pot or a, a shard. Um, you know what a shard is. It's a piece of broken pottery. It's a, uh, I think one translation says a pot shard. But it's not a vessel. It's a, broke, it's a piece of a broken mud clay vessel. So he, this, this shard that's broken is complaining about the potter. The potter has reached down and is now reshaping this into something. He's pounding it, he's melting it, he's molding it into something different than it originally was, and the, the shard doesn't like it. What piece of clay has ever complained to the potter? That's a good question. What two before has ever complained to the construction, the builder. I don't like the way you put that nail in there, and I don't like the place that you joined me to that other two before. That, it, that, that doesn't happen, does it? The builder has the right. The potter has the right. Does clay say, verse 9, to him who forms it, what are you making? Or... Your work has no handles. <laughs> the, pot, the clay, the vessel that's being reshaped, says to the potter, you didn't make a handle on it. Your work is not quite up to snuff. You ever felt like that about God? God, what are you doing in my life? Uh, you will either go two directions. One is God's not, God's not interested in you. He's not watching. He's not doing anything in you. Or you will complain to God. And what Isaiah is saying here is, stop complaining and see God as working in your life. Look at verse 10. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Now, I've, I've seen some fathers complain and say, what have I begotten? But I've never seen a child go up to his father and say, I... You know, look at me. You messed up. <laughs> look at the next one. Or what? A, who has ever said to a woman, with what are you in labor? The child, a baby being born. And the first thing it does is say, uh, you know what? I'm not a good specimen of a baby. God is father. God is mother. God is producing children. He knows how to produce a child and create life. He's a potter who knows how to make a vessel. So the first thing is stop complaining and see God active in what you're going through. A second piece of advice Isaiah has is stop doubting 
and trust God. Look at verse 13 and 14. God still speaking of Cyrus. He says, I've stirred him up in righteousness. I'll make his ways level. He will build my city. So here's one thing. He's going to build the city of Jerusalem back. He will set my exiles free. He's going to let you go. Not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. So Cyrus is going to come in. He's going to build a city, send the exiles home. It won't cost them anything, because you usually have to buy your way out of slavery. But what he's going to do is set the exiles free for nothing. And then look at verse 14. People are going to be converted because of the exile. Verse 14, Thus says the Lord, The wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush, the Sabaeans, men of stature, will come over to you. They will be yours. They will follow you. They will come over in chains and bow down to you and plead with you and say, God is in you. There's no other God beside Him. We want to be a Jew. We want to worship the God of the Jews. People are going to be converted. See, they were in exile, and when they returned under Ezra and Nehemiah in 525, 70 years later, a lot of the Gentiles that they had come to know, even some intermarried, they went back with them to Jerusalem. People were converted. You read about this in the book of Esther. It says many Jews joined them, or many Gentiles joined the Jews in that day. This big revival took place. And listen to what um, Ezra chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says. Ezra is about the return uh, from Babylon. Uh, Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia that defeated the Babylonians. He's letting them go. He said, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. So whoever is among you of all his people, may as God be with him, let him go to Jerusalem, rebuild the house of the Lord. He, <laughs> he says, hey, you know what? I know I'm a pagan and everything, but I respect you. I respect your religion. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let all of you go home and rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, and God bless you. And his, his uh, partner, Darius, in Ezra chapter 6, verse 7, listen to what he says. Let the work on this house of God alone, because they were people that were opposing it. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God. Moreover, I make a decree. Whatever you do to these for the elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of the house of God, the cost is to be paid to these men in full, without delay, from the royal revenue. That's Ezra 6, verse 7 and 8. In other words, Cyrus and Darius came in, defeated the Babylonians, told all the Jews, go home, rebuild the temple, and whatever it costs, we'll pay for it out of the royal treasury. So, so Isaiah says, you're going to go into exile, you're going to suffer. It's going to seem like an awful ordeal, and it will be. But you need to trust God, you need to see God, and trust Him. Stop complaining. It, it, uh, it would be a little bit like if the IRS called me up one day, said, uh, is this the pastor? Yes, it is. We want to send you a check. We know you, you have a vision of building an auditorium on the other side over here of your building. We want to send you a check, and we want you to build a nice auditorium at our expense. I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. If the IRS calls me up, I'm going to say, honey, I'm not home. <laughs> But these pagans are going to pay for it. What an amazing thing. 
So he's saying, I will, in verse 13, I will set my exiles free, not for price or reward. It's not going to cost you. So you need to stop doubting and trust him. He has a plan. He's on target. He's on time. He's on schedule. It reminds me of that woman who prayed each morning, and she would pray real loud. Oh, God, I need you today. And her neighbor was an atheist, and it got on his nerves. And one morning she said, Oh, God, I need groceries today. And the atheist heard it, and he thought, I'm going to prove to her there's no God. Shut her up. So he went out and bought two big bags of groceries and set it right at the front door of her house, rung the doorbell, and she came out, and there were these bags of groceries. And she started praising God. Thank you, O God. And he, the atheist jumped out of the bushes and said, See, that's not God. That was me. And then she said, Oh, thank you, oh God, for giving me groceries and making the devil pay for it. <laughs> that, when I read this story, that's, how, that's the way I think of it. And then one more point. Not only should we stop complaining and see God at work, stop doubting and trust that this God's best, He's he's going to do something wonderful. But third, we should, should stop waiting and just obey God. That's where you come to verse 15. He's a God who hides Behind the scenes. Have you ever read Esther? And you know there's not a single mention of God in the book of Esther. Oh, but you talk about the presence of God. The presence of God is all over the book of Esther. The whole, and, and it's the same time frame as you have here. God hid in the exile. But don't think he was inactive. He was doing one of his greatest works. So he says, Oh God, you're a God who hides yourself, verse 15. Albert Barnes writes about this verse. Suddenly the prophet Isaiah breaks in with his own thoughts. These are this is Isaiah's words. God, you You are going to hide yourself to Israel. But you're not going to be inactive. He says, the ways of God are sometimes dark for a season. And a long series of mysterious events may succeed each other, thus testing our faith. The dealings of God with His people in this long and painful exile would be to them mystery but would conclude with a wonderful, glorious breakthrough that would reveal the true nature of God and His intention to save many people and make His goodness known. For example, look at verse 16 and 17. All he says, after he says, you're a God who hides yourself, Verse 16, all of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go into confusion. But Israel is saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. She, you shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. God's letting you hurt for a season that you may be blessed for eternity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And look at verse 21 and 23 to 23. Verse 21. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? 150 years before it ever happened. Who declared it of old? 
Was it not I the Lord? There's no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none beside me. And I challenge you. I appeal to you. If you can find one religious book from the Koran to the, the Hindu Vishta, where there is a specific, precise prediction like this in all those books. There is none. God challenges them. He says, who told this long ago? Who declared Cyrus's name 150 years before he was ever born? Do you know what kind of DNA you have to mess with in order to produce that person and produce the parents who would name him Cyrus? Verse 22, then God turns His appeal and says, In light of this, turn to me and be you saved all the ends of the earth. He's using the exile and its restoration of the people as a message to look to Him, turn to Him. See your suffering as part of the preparations for bringing you back to Him and restoring your soul. Look at verse 23. For by myself I have sworn, my, by, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word, it will not return. To me every knee will bow, and every tongue will will swear allegiance to me. As Paul quotes this in Philippians 2, he says, every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, it seems like Isaiah is lifted up here. He's seeing, uh, he's elevated where he can see the exile is true of all of us. We have all, since Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Eden and exiled from the Garden, all of us have our need and hunger for a paradise. We are all exiles, prodigals in the far country who need to come home to the Father. And God makes this incredible prediction. When before I am done, lift up your eyes, O people of God, and see that before I am done, there won't be a single knee that won't bow the knee to me through Jesus Christ. It's amazing. It takes your breath away to see the vision of God. And he's, I don't think it necessarily means that everybody will be saved. I think he's talking about before he's done, every person is going to bow before him. And that means demons, they, they won't all go to heaven. They'll bow when it's too late. Some people will. But everybody's going to bow. I'd rather do it now. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Back in 2003, when the United States under George Bush went to war with Iraq and ultimately overthrew Saddam Hussein, and captured him. He was in a hole in the ground. Y'all remember that? They found him in a hole in the ground. Ultimately, the Iraqis executed him. But they did this special on the on Jews in Baghdad in Iraq, ancient Babylon. And they pointed out that in 1950, there were 160,000 Jews in Iraq. Hundreds of uh, synagogues. And I was watching this special, and I thought, what? What are Jews doing in Baghdad? How did they get there? They got there in 580, 600 B.C., because Nebuchadnezzar took them there. Cyrus delivered them in 530 B.C. 
and said, you can go home and rebuild the temple and I'll pay for it. Many of them stayed. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands stayed in Iraq, in Babylon. And were smothered and enveloped in the culture of ancient Babylon. And now, 1950, that would have been 2,500 years later, they still had descendants. Isaiah is saying, hey, it's time to go home. It's time for us to stop waiting and start obeying God. It's time to go home. He'll take care of you. He'll pay your bills. He'll restore your worship. He'll put a song back at take that, take that harp off that willow tree. You're going to need it. <laughs> Amen. You're going to sing again. One of my favorite preachers, he's now with the Lord, but his name was Ron Dunn. And he suffered one of the harshest blows a man could suffer. He came home, and his oldest son, Ron Dunn Jr., had uh, committed suicide. And it crushed him. He's one of the greatest preachers I ever heard in all my life. And he, he was laid aside for several months. And then God's Holy Spirit just helped him, coaxed him back into service, out of his grief. And he was again preaching. I heard him after he returned. Wow. And a lady went up to him afterwards. And she said, you know... I haven't had what you had, but I've learned something by hearing you today. I've learned I will smile again. That's return from exile. God will do that for us. Ushers, you come. Let's worship this restoring God. Let's give Him praise through our tithes and offerings this morning because God has a future. And it'll be wonderful for us, and He will restore our joy. Take your harps off the willow trees, my friend. We're going to worship in these coming days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for such for giving us such hope and promises and faith. Oh, God, for raising us, elevating us, restoring us, filling us, forgiving us, showing mercy to us, planning it all beforehand, and working in us, shaping our lives. I thank you this day, oh, God, for you and what you are doing, and to know you, that there's nothing like it in all the earth. I praise you today. Bless our offerings as we give to you in gratitude and joy. Amen.